I've had the pleasure of playing a handful of puzzle games with different styles, whether it's point and click, escape the room, or deductive reasoning. And Thank You For All These Titles offers one question. What constitutes a good puzzle game? A puzzle can be defined as a toy, problem, or other contrivance designed to amuse by presenting difficulties to be solved by ingenuity or patient effort. Breaking this definition into pieces, there are several parts to inspect that will offer a good puzzle game's true identity. Designed to amuse correlates to the ideology that games are meant to be enjoyable, so we can conclude a good puzzle must be one that keeps the player thoroughly entertained. If a player consistently loses interest, then the attractability should be increased and mechanics should be tightened. With presenting difficulties, it leans into the notion of challenge and testing the player on a variety of levels, just like the aforementioned ingenuity and patience. I believe a strong puzzle should be one that entices the player with the thought of a test, and once a player reaches the solution or connects the variables, they are enveloped in a feeling of elation where they might say, that's awesome, or wow, that's clever. The player should feel intelligent for working for the answer and recognize the wit of the developers. Bestowing this feeling on the player should be the end goal, but it's not easily reached as it needs to strike a balance and fall within the range of not too easy or too difficult. If a player is able to simply discover the answer or spend days to weeks trying to discover the solution, then it might need to be toned respectively. In an interview with Portal 2 writers Chet Falasek and Eric Wolpal, Eric addressed the reward factor and tuning of puzzles with playtesters when he responded, We also observed how they played and identified common sticking points so we could fix them. Without this cycle, the puzzles wouldn't be nearly as good. I think it should be mentioned that there are subjective components where my friend might solve a puzzle in 10 minutes, but it takes me 2 hours. Yet I like to frame this with the example of your average player. In addition to the entertainment and challenge aspects of a puzzle, a well thought out puzzle game should expand on previous knowledge as the difficulty scales with the player's progression. A player might encounter a mechanic in an earlier puzzle that might reappear in a new way later in the experience. This concept then acts as the tool a player should have saved in their repertoire, which then builds challenge when determining where and when to apply previous strategies and logic to confusing scenarios. Finally, while not essential for forming an objectively well-made puzzle, the most captivating and memorable puzzles require the principle of personality and charm. This last ingredient takes us to 2007 with the Wii, a beautiful console that, despite its gimmicks, has countless amazing titles. Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, Skyward Sword, Super Paper Mario, the best version of Resident Evil 4 in my opinion, Project M, Xenoblade Chronicles, and of course enough shovelware to have you ask yourself why did I buy over 20 copies of Billy the Wizard? It's unquestionable that the Wii had a lot of garbage forced onto it, and unfortunately that adds up to a lot of games that flew under the radar if they weren't branded with the recognizable names like Zelda or Mario. Titles like Red Steel 2, No More Heroes 2, Muramasa, The Demon Blight are all fantastic in their own right, but there's one I believe stands above the rest. Wealth, fame, power. Barbaros, the infamous pirate, obtained this and all the splendor of Treasure Island and his promise to Zack and Wiki drove them to the far ends of the earth. You want my ship? You can have it! I left my vessel and everything I gathered in one place. Now you just have to help me! These words put Zack and Wiki on a quest in pursuit of riches greater than they could think of. This is the game known as Zack and Wiki. So come over and bring along all your weary modes. Together we Solve the puzzles that are in our way There's always room for you For you to be player too Zack and Wiki's quest for the treasure Zack and Wiki was a game that surprised me to say the least. My first exposure stemmed from my brother over 10 years ago when he was on the Wii hype train and came to me excited about this puzzle game named Zack and Wiki, The Quest for Barbarossa's Treasure. Apparently, the subtitle on IGN's review was the real hook for him. Well, you got me. Originally, the title made me think it was going to be some garbage game and my brother was too far gone. However, his description about a colorful puzzle using the Wii's pattern and motion controls piqued my interest. Eventually, he bought the game, I took a look at the cover, and oh, it was made by Capcom. From there, it was history. I love Zack and Wiki and claim that it's one of the best puzzle games. But why is that? What Zack and Wiki does so well is applies all of those principles of a good puzzle game and uses them to craft a punishing yet wonderful title. Something interesting to consider is how Zack and Wiki structures puzzles, as it could be labeled as a puzzle room, but it's not exactly something like Zero Escape where your goal is to escape, or Zelda where it's a labyrinth of sorts. 
As a result, I refer to Zack and Wiki's approach as puzzle arenas, and these constructions allow for self-contained challenges oozing individuality and memorability. With this video, the areas I plan to cover are a brief overview, an examination of the game's aesthetics, and primarily an in-depth analysis on how Zack and Wiki builds his puzzles, with each area uniting to showcase how this game employs the four principles of good puzzle games. Before beginning, while Zack and Wiki might not be a narrative-intensive game, I will be showing clips from the puzzles and discussing them in depth, so if you don't want to know some of the solutions to the puzzles, then consider this a spoiler warning. Without further ado, let's set sail. Let's start with the premise. You take control of Zack, a young pirate boy with high dreams of becoming one of the greatest pirates, along with his best friend Wiki, a helicopter monkey that resembles everybody's favorite foxy sidekick. Both of them are members of a group called the Sea Rabbits, which doesn't really make any sense since neither of them are rabbits? But regardless, after being attacked by a rival group led by a girl named Rose, Zack and Wiki evacuate their plane, float to the ground, and come across a cursed chest that is inhabited by the infamous pirate Barbaros, who is totally not a bad guy. Barbaros has been split into pieces, and in exchange for reassembling him, he promises to give his legendary ship to Zack. From there, Zack and Wiki travel to the puzzle-infested lands to find Barbaros' parts and strike it rich. Zack and Wiki is really light on narrative, but that's perfectly fine since the main focus is on the ingenious manner that puzzles and mechanics are fleshed out to create an exemplary experience. The game also has a very pleasing art style, which is used to give characters large, animated expressions. The principle of charm is articulated effectively through these characters not through their engaging backstories or strong dialogue, but how they react to situations and their shapes. The characters each have really colorful and unique designs, but it's mostly seen in the two leads where Wiki is ordained with intricate patterns to display his mystery, and Zack rocks the look of a disheveled, ambitious pirate, with thrown-together clothes that have his torso laid bare, accompanied by a hat and blue shorts, which is very reminiscent of Luffy from One Piece. It's a small design choice, but I love how Zack's left shoe is broken at the toe cap a feature that emphasizes how careless he is of anything aside from chocolate and riches. As for their expressions, just take a look at how Zack and Wiki react to obstacles and game overs. There are so many unique animations for these that it makes each failure feel like a careful consideration by the developers and strongly encourages the player to think, okay, maybe I should not do that next time. The overall art style fits very well with the game's tone and fails to look dated due to the good understanding of the Wii's graphical limits. The only problem I really have is the naked dude in the top right corner that acts as a guide for how to properly use the Wiimote. He just stares into your soul and stands there menacingly. On another note, the soundtrack is pretty solid. It has its fair share of triumphant and adventurous pieces in the form of the title theme, the beginning, and the results, in addition to mysterious tunes that do well in enhancing the atmosphere and making you cautious of a failure at any corner. My favorite song would have to be the one that accompanies the ice boss Chillion. Chill Lion? Ch chill Ion? Sure. Good. The epic choir and instruments give off this climatic feeling that fits the boss encounter exceptionally well. Also, in regards to sound design, the noises they use for clicking around and using items is very satisfying, and I especially like the jarring noise that plays right before a game over, since it hits deep and firmly cements that ya done messed up. I always feel it's necessary to address the soundtracks of games, since a solid collection of music can elevate a game from being simply good to great due to how well it sticks with you and amplifies the game's message or design philosophy. Although, the presence of solid music and well-executed aesthetics builds upon the principle of charm that gives a puzzle game its luster. Charm isn't simply restricted to outside variables, however, as it can be witnessed in gameplay along with the other principles just as well. Acting is the core to the Zack and Wiki experience and the most discussed feature, the puzzles ought to be something special, and they truly are. The game contains 24 levels that are mainly divided amongst four worlds. A jungle littered with hungry goblins and booby traps, an icy land with the scariest butler I've ever seen, a treacherous volcano filled with ancient technology, and Barbarossa's castle that contains some of the game's best puzzles. Since the areas themselves are varied and the game doesn't overstay its welcome in one locale, puzzles remain fresh and inspired. 
Within each level, there will be a chest that contains a part of Barbaros, and needs to be opened through the completion of various steps. These steps serve as milestones in a way that informs the player if they are making progress or how well they completed the step, as indicated through the fraction of points the player receives. The higher the score, the better you performed, and the closer you are to reaching the level's chest. Solving puzzles involves the use of your Wiimote, as you click to move around or on various objects that could be examined or picked up. With the item in perspective, it's very likely you'll have to use the motion controls to interact, whether it's pulling a lever or sawing down a tree with a centipede. Yes, you heard that right. On top of being a floating monkey, Wiki has the ability to transform into a bell that could be shaken with the Wiimote near living creatures to turn them into helpful items. A centipede will become a saw, a bat becomes an umbrella, and a frog turns into a bomb. You know, the logical conclusion. With the wide arsenal of animal weapons, it's up to you to properly complete steps and solve the puzzles in the correct manner so you can secure that piece of Barbaros that lies in the cursed chest. The kicker comes in the word properly, as puzzle arenas can essentially become softlocked or result in a game over if a sequence has failed or the player solves the puzzle in the wrong order. Take for example the level Free Colossi. You've successfully lowered the chest to a place where all you need to do is climb up the stairs and open it. Well, that's a shame, because you've earned yourself a game over. Or in the level Dragon Scales, if you jump to the other side without sending the other goon totem, you've essentially made the puzzle incompletable. This is where Zack and Wiki earns a reputation for not being simply difficult, but brutal and unrelenting. However, these situations could be countered by purchasing and using Oracle Dolls and Platinum Tickets from the Sea Rabbit's Hideout at the cost of a lower score at the puzzle's results screen. Zack and Wiki's punishment system is part of what fulfills the principle of challenge with a well-crafted puzzle game, but there's also the examples where the circumstances are less dire. Due to the very nature of the puzzles, there will likely come a time that the player might get stumped on the correct order or stumble on their execution of a step. As I mentioned, the player is allotted points based on their performance, which means figuring out the solution to a step quickly and effectively will result in more points, while floundering around will result in significantly less. It encourages a form of replayability, albeit not much, and adds a sense of pressure. With both of these measurements of difficulty, I feel they successfully impart a feeling of euphoria onto the player. On a basic level, getting more points from the successful completion of steps gives you these funny character portraits that are drawn better the more you rank up. I love these, as I'm always excited to see what the next rank looks like. This man leveled up from using crayons to a portrait from the 1600s. Regarding the more punishing half, a great example is Keeper of the Ice, one of Zack and Wiki's most intimidating puzzles due to the short bursts of free time allowing for limited mobility and just the concept of something chasing you. You try out running this evil butler from hell, beating him with a stick, and none of it works. Perhaps after a couple failed attempts, you are able to bait him onto the ice and realize the demon butler begins to sink a bit. The big challenge comes in how you will get him to return back to the ice and fall through completely, and when you succeed, it brings a huge sigh of relief. Another sensation of exhilaration comes in the Chill Lion boss fight. The level is centered around the proper use of light and mirrors to melt the boss and save Wiki, yet you are limited to a certain amount of moves and mirrors will continuously break the further you move. Chill Lion is recognized as one of, if not the hardest boss, and I could personally say I felt incredibly proud of my ability to weave through the obstacles before me, as well as acknowledge those thoughtfully placed hurdles. And these examples were the result of my many, many, many failures. This feeling is the culmination of a successful challenge within a game and what I believe helps Zack and Wiki satiate this principle. In order to discuss the principle of progression in Zack and Wiki, I'd like to analyze one of the final and best levels, The Painted Secret. The level contains two floors with a variety of paintings in various sizes and contents. Clicking on one to investigate will reveal the strength of this level, which is found in the interaction between the player and paintings as they will have to grab or place items inside them to progress. There are four pieces of the chest scattered among the paintings that need to be retrieved and brought back to the starting area. The puzzle starts off simple with the ability to grab a faucet and a broom fairly easily from a painting, but you'll soon learn that not everything can be grabbed or touched inside. The player is put into a relatively safe environment where there really aren't any serious consequences from thoughtlessly reaching into a painting for a majority of the puzzle arena. The biggest consequence is Zack hurting his hand on some forms and losing some points as a result. That is, until you reach the end. 
One of the final paintings contains a very familiar cave and a pair of eyes with the last piece of the chest waiting at the bottom. Something definitely seems off, but the player might carelessly reach in to grab it since there hasn't been a fatal repercussion yet and will get a game over as a result. The player could feel slighted, but the level was actually paced exceptionally well where the first floor paintings were beginner steps, the forney painting on the top floor was an intermediate step, and the fish was the expert leveled one. The player's danger level scaled appropriately with their progression, which serves as an excellent representation of how this principle should be executed. The Painted Secret also serves as a great example when examining outside the contents of this level alone. In the level King of the Jungle, the first boss fight the game has to offer, the player will reach a part where the boss blocks their route to the chest and they will die if they attempt to challenge him. There's a rope above him that will lead you right to the chest, but no way to ride it. The solution comes from taking an umbrella, flipping the object, and using the hook to ride along the rope to grab the treasure. It's a pretty clever twist on the item that players will need to save in their repertoire. According to an article called Puzzles as a Creative Form of Play in the Journal of Virtual Worlds Research, a puzzle does not constitute an isolated object, but as an object able to impulse and provoke huge discoveries. This excerpt basically dictates that the isolated object, or solution to a problem in this case, yields a noteworthy discovery. However, the process itself grants another discovery. The mechanic of flipping objects takes on the figurative role of the discovery found for the process, as it is eventually brought back in the painted secret. As mentioned previously, there's a forney painting that contains a piece of the chest, however, it can't be grabbed. The player might try to sweep it out or do something with the base of the tree, but to no avail. The solution comes from the mechanic implemented in King of the Jungle, where the player must flip the object. Since it's a different item and was presented so much later into the game, the player might not consider flipping the broom at first. Nevertheless, the base attributes of the item like length and application of a real-world solution would lead the player to the answer, therefore feeling warranted and fair. By having the stakes and application of materials progress not only with a single level, but over the course of the entire journey, the player is able to gain a better understanding of the game's inner workings, and the developers are allowed to get more creative with their implementations, increasing diversity. This, in turn, provides variety that paves the way for the final principle. I fit the principle of entertainment is hard to determine since fun is subjective, but I think that Zack and Wiki does well in making the journey exciting for the diversity in its levels and respective puzzles as well as the changes in pacing. What's fun is how each area presents its own set of puzzles that thematically run through each level, such as the different applications of water in the volcano cavern or the use of mirrors in the frozen temple. Yet each of their uses are so drastically different that they feel unique. For example, the mirror in the Crystal Key is used as a magnifying glass to melt water and construct a new key, while Frostbreath's mirrors are about bouncing light in thoughtful patterns to defeat an enemy. Concerning the Temple of Levels, I'd say there are three main archetypes that form Zack and Wiki's puzzles. Ones where you can work at a relaxed pace and are more concerned with logical thinking and the evasion of traps in a compact environment such as the Crystal Key or the Pit of Tragedy, racing against the clock as an imminent threat rapidly approaches or lies in wait after a number of failures like Relics of the Past or Frost Breath, and the puzzles that are heavily oriented around items that form a jigsaw puzzle of sorts, just like the Icicle of Prosperity. With this variance of design pacing, Zack and Wiki offers a player a smorgasbord of puzzles where you might find a certain style that connects better with you. There's even boss fights awaiting at the end of each world to raise the stakes and reward the completing of a puzzle. Despite the small number of total puzzles, the amount of death and thought that composes each of them presents a complete package that will leave the player happy, and perhaps looking for more, a true testament to the game's enjoyability. I will fully admit that Zack and Wiki does have two notable flaws, being the finicky motion controls as typical of an early Wii game, and the lack of replayability outside of pursuing a higher score. But it's a truly magical experience. Examining the review scores reveals an incredibly positive outlook both with the critics and in terms of fan reception. Not to mention a handful of awards and accolades, such as Adventure Game of the Year from GameSpot, and a spot on IGN's top 25 Wii games. So. Why don't more people talk about this game? Well, that's likely thanks to the sales numbers, which were quite frankly abysmal for a studio like Capcom, with only 126,000 units sold in 26 months. Senior Director of Communications at the time, Chris Kramer, cited the difficulties of publishing a game on the Wii's market due to the confusion regarding the console's core audience and the chaotic evidence. Capcom product manager Colin Ferris offered a different take that revolved around the character design of Zack as a shirtless pirate boy. Regarding the title sentiment, he mentioned, That is actually a personal favorite of a lot of people in Capcom. 
So don't be surprised if you see it again, but we have nothing in the works at the moment. Zack and Wiki has an adoring following and is an amazing puzzle game, which is indicative of the high praise, but I don't think we'll be seeing a Zack and Wiki 2. It's an unfortunate reality, but if anything you saw in this video caught your eye and you want a creative and challenging puzzle game, then I deeply implore you to pick up a copy of Zack and Wiki. It can be found on the Wii U Virtual Console for $20, but you can pretty easily find a physical copy for the Wii for $10 or less, which is my personal recommendation. More people need to hear about this game. Zack and Wiki, The Quest for Barbarossa's Treasure is the definition of a hidden gem, and what I'd consider the Wii's buried treasure. Hello there everybody, I just want to say as always, thank you so much for watching this video, and I really do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, or something in this video caught your eye, I would be really appreciative if you liked and subscribed, as it really does help out the channel. This video means a lot to me actually. Zack and Wiki, as I mentioned, is it's definitely a hidden gem, but it's also representative to me of my youth and when my, uh, my brother and I would live in the same place and we'd play games together and just just that excitement and kind of all culminates into this video and this is my my passion project for it i do want to say thank you to my brother for helping me out with the script and also for introducing me to this game in the first place he's been a really big supporter of everything that i've really been doing with this channel and so i i really want to thank him for that I also really want to thank my friends Shwai and RJ for helping me out with the musical portion of this video. I had this idea going into this video that I wanted to do something a bit more ambitious uh, than some of my previous projects and I wanted to do the work to put it in and so thank you to him for lending his vocal talents as well as my friend RJ for his uh, vocal abilities for doing the narrator and Barbaros. That's really all I have to say for now though regarding the video so thank you so much and until next time.